Father, I just thank you for uh, today, just for the opportunity we have to come each week and to uh, lift our voices together and worship and hear your uh, message proclaimed. And Father, I just pray that um, you just bless us as we close out this year and looking forward to a new year. Um, just use us to shed your, uh, spread your light here in Winslow, Lord. I just pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. When the music fades and all is stripped away and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that'll bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you it's all about you Jesus I'm sorry Lord for everything I've made it when it's all about you all about you Jesus you king of endless words no one could express how much you deserve though I'm weak and poor all I have is yours every single breath I'll 
I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it And it's all about you all about you, Jesus. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see the beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. And you're all together lovely. All together worthy. All together wonder to me King of all days oh so highly exalted glorious in heaven above humbly you came to the earth you created all for love's sake became poor so here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me, and I'll never know. How much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross so here I am to worship here I am All together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of worship And it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for
Lord, I come and I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. And without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sin runs deep, your grace is more. Where grace is found is where you are. And where you are, Lord, I am free. Holiness is Christ in me. Yes, where you are, Lord, I am free. Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I Teach my song to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. In meeting, have a seat. Children, come on up. Did anybody get a present yesterday? You got some? Anyone get anything really special? What'd you get? You got a scooter? Cool. Okay. You know, does anyone have any presents left that you haven't opened yet? You have one you haven't opened? At your mom and dad's house. Okay. I have a present that I haven't given yet, and uh, we're going to see our grandkids later this week, and so I'm going to take a gift to them and, and show them, but I didn't want to forget it, so Patty, I told Patty, I said, I'm going to put it out by the Christmas tree, and I'm going to show you what it looks like, sort of. It's a piggy bank. And here's what it is. I'm trying to figure out, if you're like my grandkids, they have more toys than they know what to do with. 
Do you have more toys than you know what to do with? So I was trying to figure out what can I do to teach them about giving. And so I had this piggy bank, and it was full of coins. And, there's, and so when I uh, took it outside or out to the living room, I was holding it, and as I bend over to put it down, this is what it looked like. It broke open. So if you look at my piggy bank, it's got all kinds of cracks in it because I glued it together. But um, what I'm going to do is uh, we put it in jars, and we're going to give them the jars. But I'm going to tell them they can only keep half of it. And the other half, they've got to figure out where can they give it to help somebody else. So it's either like a mission group or they can give it to someone in their church that's hurting. But uh, it's not all about getting for ourselves. How can we also give? So that's what I'm going to try and do with them. And I, I talked to their parents about it, so they, it's not going to be a surprise when we get there, because someone has to count that. <laughs> and that's a, it's a, you can take, take the word on it. Um, the last time, I, that's actually, a, I was hoping that I would be able to salvage it, but I cannot. Um, but that's a, the second time it's been full. I've been saving for six years. So that's six years of worth of pocket change and uh, fighting Patty because she always wants to give them exact change. And I'm like, no, don't give them exact change because I want coins. And uh, so we kind of fight about that. But here's what we don't fight. Discuss. <laughs> Sternly. <laughs> so <laughs> I remind you. <laughs> so With enthusiasm. Um, so I was thinking about a gift. There's a lot of gifts. No, even no matter what your best gift is today, when you are my age, it's probably not going to be here. I was trying to think. I don't have anything I can think of that I got as a kid. You know, um, I don't know. But you know what? Some gifts are really cool. Some of them are not so cool. I remember I used to get like underwear. It's like, what kind of a gift is that to give to a kid? Um, but Jesus says, I've got a gift I want to give to you. And this is in Romans chapter 6, verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So what God's saying is, I'm giving you a gift, and it comes through Jesus Christ. So if you trust in him, learn about him, follow him, you can have that free gift. And that free gift is eternal life. That means it's going to last forever. Never going to break. Never going to get old. But it's always going to be there. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you. Uh, we get so many gifts during the year with birthdays and Christmas. But Lord, help us to understand that the greatest gift is knowing you and spending eternity with you. I just thank you for these kids that are here. just ask you to bless them as we uh, um, continue to worship, Lord. For its name in Jesus we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Ted. Thank you, Mike. You know, sometimes we kind of take our, our worship team for granted during the Christmas season and how much extra work they have to do for not only preparing for Sunday, but Christmas Eve to where it's almost all music. So it weighs pretty heavily on the music guy and the tech team and the praise team, and so we really appreciate all the extra work they did. You know, Malcolm Muggeridge was a very famous and highly respected British journalist who for many years was an ardent atheist. His opinions and thoughts were coveted by American publishers, and he occasionally wrote the editorial page for Time magazine. And toward the end of his illustrious career as a dean of British broadcasters, he became a Christian. And following his conversion, he was a guest at a breakfast in Washington, D.C., where he shared his life story. And when he had finished his testimony, he made a number of comments about world affairs, all of which were very pessimistic. One of those present asked, Dr. Muckeridge, you have been very pessimistic. Don't you have any reason for optimism? He replied, I could not be more optimistic than I am because my hope is in Jesus Christ alone. He allowed that remark to settle in for a few seconds, and he added, just think if the apostolic church had pinned all of its hopes on the Roman Empire. You know, I look around, we're coming into a new year, kind of wondering what's coming for 2022, and all the jokes are already out there about how the future looks in comparison to where we've been. And it's a little bit difficult to not be a little fearful, a little nervous, filled with just a little bit of anxiety and maybe even discouragement as we look at what's going on in our culture and what's looking going on in our whole world with how our leaders are behaving and some of the uh, requirements that are coming down and just like wondering, you know, what exactly does our future look like? And so when we look at that, and we pause to consider that when God had his people celebrate the new year, and their new year was sometimes kind of terrifying too, he would always have them blow trumpets. I thought that was kind of strange tradition, strange law to command your people for the new year, blow trumpets. What if they weren't particularly happy about the new year? What if they were a little scared about the new year? What do you mean blowing trumpets? And then basically, what, what, what idea do you get from the blowing of trumpets? What feeling does that invoke? Do you get fear when you blow trumpets? Do you want to hide when you blow trumpets? No. Blowing trumpets is a battle cry. It's a charge or it's a celebration. It's a jubilation, right? And God always wanted that every year. Why? How? When everything looks kind of scary. Well, obviously, as Christians, we're not supposed to be pinning all of our hopes on the Roman Empire. You know, God gives us our governments, right? I mean, they maintain order, they're supposed to promote justice, but at the very bottom line, our government is run by people who are just people. Men and women who were born dirty, rotten sinners just like you and I are. And many of them still are because they're completely blind and deaf to the mysterious supernatural truths of the gospel. We're still supposed to submit to them according to God's decree as long as they're not commanding you to do something that God specifically told you not to. But at the same time, that's not where I put my hope. That's the number one thing that we keep in our mind as we look at this time of year. Number two thing that we keep in our mind is you know, right, that there's not a governmental system on the planet that can mess God up. They can't stop his plan. They can't stop his timing because he is reigning over all of it, which means whatever comes our way, if he's allowing it, That means he has a reason. And when we love him, his reason is good. 
Now, I look at the nativity scene. You know, the original story when Jesus came and entered our planet. You know, right, that our Christmas cards are a little misleading. Because our nativity scenes, you know, they're all peaceful and and you just kind of feel like it's a quiet night and the cattle are just making their little moo sounds and, and it's just so nice. But you know, right, that that world was horrible when Jesus walked in. I mean, you look at what was going on in his own country. We were covering this a few Sunday nights ago. But what was going on in Israel when Jesus showed up? They had just come out of centuries of some of the worst times in their entire history. Not only were they tormented under Alexander the Great when Alexander died, Israel became the battleground for control between Egypt and Syria. And eventually, Syria won. And the guy that rose to power was this guy by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes IV. And Daniel talks about him, and I would argue that Daniel uses him as a little bit of a foreshadowing of who the Antichrist is going to be. He was just so demonic in his hatred towards God's people. The way that he would torture them and abuse them and oppress them. But then they get a little bit of reprieve. For those of you who are history buffs or you have your Catholic version of the Bible where there's the Apocrypha in there, I do not think that the Apocrypha is scripture, but at the same time, they got some great history in there. And it talks about the Maccabean revolt where they threw off the Syrian oppression and they had a little bit of a brief reprieve as long as those Maccabees were alive, but then they died. Now there is this leadership vacuum that just threw all of Israel into the civil unrest and civil war to where factions were warring against factions. All kinds of non-military civilians by the thousands were killed. You had their leaders assassinated by their own family members. You had other leaders that were so corrupt. One guy crucified 800 of his own people, even though he was Jewish too. And then you have the Roman Empire. Why is the Roman Empire there in the opening pages in the New Testament? Did you know that the Jews actually called them there? There are two Jewish factions that were warring against each other and neither one could win. So one of the Jewish factions called the Roman Empire and said, can you help us fight our enemy Jews for us and give us peace? And so the Roman Empire said, we'll do that. They came in, they crushed the opposition and they said, oh, by the way, if we're going to give this kind of money and this kind of manpower to help you with your troubles, this is now a Roman province. And one of the things that they established pretty quick was this king by the name of Herod the Great. Wasn't even a Jew, but all of a sudden he was the king of the Jews. And you know Herod the Great, he would kill his own family members to hold on to his power. In the Bible we see that he was willing to kill babies in a whole town in order to hold on to his power. Now he did try to win the Jews' loyalty a little bit. I mean, he built this beautiful temple that just really amazed Jesus and the well. Amazed the apostles. Jesus wasn't that impressed. But even that, he also built a bunch of pagan temples to satisfy his pagan subjects. And with the Jewish temple, what he did is he put a Roman eagle on the front of it so that he can make the Romans happy. So the Jews really didn't know what to do with King Herod. He wasn't as popular. He did these wonderful, huge building projects that were amazing, but that also meant huge taxes. And they had to pay for it. So people really weren't big fans of King Herod, but at least they had their priesthood, right? And they were oppressed by the Romans. They were oppressed by King Herod, but at least they had the priesthood. They had the high priest that could hold on to God's word and be a light in their darkness. Is that the way it was? Now, in their law, there was very specifics about what God expected of the high priest and who was supposed to be high priest and what family line was supposed to produce the high priesthood. But King Herod just kind of gave the high priesthood to whoever he wanted. So basically, it went to the highest bidder. If you had enough money, you could buy the office of high priest. And these guys were not typically your most godly guys. These guys were the ones that just wanted the highest office of power in the, Jew, in the Jewish culture. And so whoever came up with the highest amount of money won. 
That was their picture of God. That was who ran the temple. That was their religion that was supposed to be the light and the darkness. And into this is what Jesus came. It wasn't a happy nativity scene. Any righteous man around would have been wailing in anguish. I mean, no wonder the cattle were lowing. It was a miserable experience, but Jesus came and picked this exact time to say, this is when I'm going to accomplish my mission. And we look at Jewish history after Jesus, it's like, well, he didn't fix anything. I mean, just 40 years after Jesus left, the Romans came in and killed everybody, tore down the temple, destroyed Jerusalem. The Jews ceased being a country for 2,000 years. What exactly was Jesus' mission? Obviously, it wasn't to fix Judea. And can I say today, Jesus' mission is not to fix America either. By all means, pray for America. Jesus is the only hope that America has, but at the same time, that's not his utmost in priorities. As much as I love my freedoms, I love my American prosperity, Those aren't the things at the top of Jesus' list because that's not why he came, to give us the land of the free and the home of the brave. What he came to do is bring us a hope, love, joy, peace that's found only in him. And because of that, there isn't an administration alive that can take it away. But how did he come to bring us this? If you can turn with me to a prophet that talked about Jesus' coming 700 years before he ever came. This is found in Isaiah chapter 9. This is found on page 573 if you're following along in a Bible that you can get in the foyer. Or if it's your own Bible, you know, Isaiah is like a little bit to the right of the middle, and it's a very long book. Chapter 9, verse 1. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish, talking about the nation of Israel. In the former time, God brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, But in the latter time, he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations, because the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. You know, during this time when Isaiah wrote this, Israel was in such a shambles. The people wholeheartedly and as a nation, they had rejected the ways of God. If you read the rest of Isaiah around this time, um, you see that they were even consulting dead people more than they were wanting to hear what God had to say. It was a time to where they were so evil, they were making themselves miserable. Their lives were filled with gloom. They were filled with distress. Nothing was going their way. Big surprise when you reject the ways of God. But here's the irony. They were making themselves miserable due to their own actions and their own decisions, but they were blaming God because everything was so bad. God, why did you do this to me? God's like, what are you talking about? You did this to yourself. And it would be so easy for God to say, you know what? Forget you. You rejected my ways. You rejected my prophets. You rejected my law that I clearly wrote down for you to have for all time. I chose you as my chosen people. You did all this in return. Just eat the own, your own cake that you bake. Sleep in your own bed. I'm not going to do anything for you. But that's not what he told Isaiah to say. He told Isaiah to give this message. You know, the land is filled with darkness. But from Naphtali and Zebulun, two of the tribes of Israel, there is going to come a great light that permeates your darkness and is going to deliver you 
from your distress. Now, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, why Nebulun and Zophtali? It says that once upon a time, God uh, brought them into contempt. And your version might say, he humbled Nebulun and Naphtali, Zebulun and Naphtali, and all of a sudden, uh, they're the ones that are going to produce a great light from them, which is going to become the land of Galilee, the land that's part Gentiles. From them is going to come this light that will deliver them. Why them? What's so special about them? Well, it helps to know the two tribes, uh, Zebulun and Naphtali, just geographically. They're the northernmost part of the country, which means when you read Old Testament history, when they were attacked by the Syrians, Naphtali and Zebulun were the first ones attacked. Later on, when uh, the Assyrians came and wiped out the entire country, Zebulun and Naphtali, they were the first two tribes to fall. They were supposed to be the number one defense, and so they were the ones that were built up and fortified to hold on any attack from any northern enemies. But they failed at their job, and as a result, the entire country fell into ruin, and they were taken away into captivity. It was humiliating. If any Israelite ever wanted to ask themselves, how could this happen to them, very quickly they could say, it's their fault. Zebulun and Naphtali, they didn't do their job. They didn't protect us. It's their fault. They were the ones that were their greatest source of shame for Israel. And all of a sudden, God was turning them into the greatest source of grace. And if that's not the Christian message, I don't know what is. If you had that proverbial time machine that I always like to bring up because I like thinking about it, and you can go back to any point in your life to just change one regret, one really evil decision that you made and you realize you can't blame it on anybody else, it was all you. And if anybody came up to you and said, hey, I know your secrets, immediately you come to that. And you're like, how did they find out about this? If you can go back into a time machine and change just one thing that, that altered the course of your life, and you're like, man, I wish I didn't do that, what would it be? What are you carrying on your shoulders? What guilt do you have hidden in the closet that you hope that nobody's going to find out? If it's anything like this, God would say, that's what I can use to teach you about my deepest grace. This is what I can use to teach you about how much I love you. Want to know a mystery? We've had testimonies from up here. I love hearing them. As a Christian, I love hearing other people's stories about what Jesus did for them. And one of the things that fascinates me is we've had people come up here and share their story. And you know what they would tell you is, I don't want the time machine. It's like, really? I mean, we're talking about people who spent years with drugs and alcohol, all kinds of flavors of sexual immorality, absolute in your face rebellion against God where they shook their fists in the air saying, I don't need you. And they're saying, I don't want the time machine. If you gave me the opportunity to go back and change something about my life, I wouldn't do it. Oh, don't get me wrong. They hate what they did. They're repulsed by what they did. But at the same time, they say, I wouldn't change it. And you're thinking, well, why wouldn't you change that if God gave you the chance? And they will tell you. It's because with that experience... I learned how much God loves me. My sin was deep. But because of it, I learned that God's grace is even deeper. And it's from that that I realized what the gospel is really all about. Now, don't get me wrong. They're not saying, oh, so I'm just going to go out and sin some more so I can experience more grace. That's not the Bible message either. 
Because God's grace can also keep us from doing those horrible things in our life, and we can experience his love that way too. But here's the point. Sometimes God will deliberately allow you to do something that's bad, and rather than just live under the crushing guilt that you made that terrible decision, how much more refreshing is it to look at that situation and instead of look at the sin, be crushed by the sin, look up and realize that God is right there waiting for you. Winning to give you forgiveness for it all. Completely wipe the slate clean so that you don't have to live with the reputation of Naphtali or Zebulun anymore. Instead, you can be the land of great light to where because of what Jesus did for you, now you have a story that you can share with other people that need it. Let's keep going. Verse 4. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you've broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. Why? For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. You know, when Isaiah had his ministry, there was an evil king named Ahaz that was in charge of everything. And he wanted to fix the situation that his government was in a shambles. And so what he did, even though Isaiah said, don't do this, is he called over to the Assyrians, the bad guy in the block, and said, rescue us. Much like the Jews did in the New Testament days or right before the New Testament days with the Romans. King Ahaz did it first. He called over to the enemy and said, rescue us. Protect us. We'll serve you. We'll be your slaves. We'll pay you tribute. We just need your help. And God was saying, hey, I'll give you your protection. Just turn to me. Ahaz wasn't willing to submit to God's ways, and so he turned to Assyria instead. When we were going through the book of Isaiah here a while ago, this was a big topic of conversation for Isaiah. It really bothered him. And here God says, you know what? I can bring you the deliverance that you're looking for, but I'm going to do it like I did in the days of Midian. What's he referring to? He's referring to one of my favorite Bible stories. When I was a kid and today, it's just a cool story. Remember in the book of Judges where the Midianites were oppressing God's people for seven years? I mean, they would just go on these raids to where anything you had, they would steal it. If it's something that they didn't want, chances are they'd kill it. I mean, it was just oppression because God's people had rejected God again, so God turned them over to the oppression of the Midianites. It was this way for seven years. The people were crying out, God, this is horrible. Save us. We're sorry. And God decided to deliver them. But he did not call upon a mighty man to come to the rescue. He did not call upon a mighty kingdom to ride on over and give them deliverance. He picked on a farmer named Gideon, who at the time of this was hiding because he was scared the Midianites were going to hurt him and steal his stuff. And when God shows up to say, I'm appointing you to come to the rescue, Gideon's answer was, it can't be me. You know, I am the weakest member of the weakest family of the weakest clan of the weakest tribe of all of Israel. Pick Pee Wee Herman. Do not pick me. I'm not going to, I don't know how to fight. I don't know, I I can't do it. And God says, I'm going to be with you. And if I say you can do it, you can do it. So let's get going. So Gideon, he gives out the call. Hey, God's called us to fight against the Midianites, chase them off. Who wants to come? 32,000 men answered the call fighting against 135,000 Midianites. 
The odds against them winning were four to one. Gideon's ready. Battle lines are drawing. God speaks again. And, God, and Gideon's thinking, thank you, God, that you're giving me your word because I'm absolutely terrified. To beat these guys, they outnumber us four to one. And God speaks from on high and he says, your army is too big. So anybody who's scared, go on home. Gideon says, really? God's like, anyone who's scared, hey, guys, if we're scared, we can go home. Last one home's a rotten egg. God says, except for you. 22,000 people decided, yeah, this isn't what I signed up for. This is crazy. This is suicide. We're going home. Gideon's left with 10,000 people. Odds against him now are 13.5 to 1. They might be able to do pretty good against the .5 guy, but the other 13 had him confused and, and scared. God speaks again. <sighs> Thank you, God. Give me an answer. What's the solution? And God says, here's my solution. Your army's still too big. Are you serious? Are you kidding me? The odds against me are, are, are. God says 13.5 to 1. Yeah! 13.5 to 1. Are you kidding me? God says, tell everybody to get a drink of water. Anybody that just sticks their face in the water, you can send home. Anybody who brings the water up so they can lap it like a dog, them you can keep. Gideon's like, all right, guys, are you thirsty? Why don't you go get yourself a drink of water? 9,700 men stuck their face in the water. The Bible doesn't say this, but I can just imagine Gideon going around and kicking people. <laughs> Who taught you how to drink? What's your problem? 300 men going against 135,000. For them to win, every single guy was going to have to beat 450 soldiers all by himself. God says, Gideon, I'm your deliverer. Don't worry. And you know the very first battle, they fought without swords. They had a trumpet and a torch. They held up the torch. They blew the trumpet. They screamed at the top of their lungs. And God struck such panic in the Midianite camp, they started killing each other before they decided to run into the night for their lives. And God said, see, I did it. All you need is me. And God's talking here saying, I'm going to deliver you, but it's going to look more like the days of Midian. In other words, don't look for power. Don't look for strength. Don't look for all these things that the world looks for. And whoever has the most money, they're the ones that can save us. Whoever has the most political clout, they're the ones that can save us. As long as we get the majority behind us, that's who can save us. God says, actually, no, what you need is me. And chances are, I'm not going to work from what you consider to be strength. I'm going to work from what you would consider to be weakness. And he starts describing the birth of a baby. A helpless baby who's laying there crying. He's going to be everything you need. Why? Because he's going to be a wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Here's our message today. You're looking at the new year coming. I, oh man, what's going to happen? What's around the next corner? This is what you need. You need a wonderful counselor. A counselor who's right there to guide you, right there to listen to you, right there to give you words that can totally change your life if you heed them. And he's not like any other counselor. He's a wonderful counselor. Wonderful. One of those, that word being one of the words that we mess up. Somebody has a birthday, you're like, oh, that's wonderful. That doesn't just mean it's cool. Or it's good. It means it fills you with wonder. It fills you with awe. It fills you with this feeling of, oh my word, I can't believe he's that kind of a counselor. He totally changed my life. 
This child provides you with a wonderful counselor that you can talk to anytime. You don't have to make an appointment. His hours are always open. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. Even though he's a baby, he has the power of the universe within him. He was the creator. He is the sovereign one who's in control of absolutely everything to where nothing happens unless he says okay. And if he says okay, it's because he has a really good reason. And if you love him, you know that really good reason is for your benefit. How can you be scared when you got somebody like that on your side? Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father. Now, don't use this the way I've heard some people use it to say, oh, so there really is no such thing as a trinity. Actually, Jesus is God the Father. Well, you can't just throw out the rest of the Bible. It wasn't like at his baptism, Jesus was speaking to himself saying, I am my beloved son, in me I am well pleased. I mean, there really was God the Father speaking about God the Son and God the Holy Spirit came down. There really is a trinity. What this is saying is Jesus has a compassion on you as if you're his own kid and he's going to care for you the way the perfect father would care for his kid. But he's not just a father, he's an everlasting father. Can I just say, I love my kids dearly. I would easily lay my life down for them. I mean, I jumped to the opportunity to put my way or myself in the face of danger to save them because I love them. I want to protect them. I want to help them. I want to guide them. But you know one of my real weaknesses? I'm mortal. I can make the promise I will never leave you and I will never forsake you, but I can't keep that. I'm not omnipresent. I'm not omnipotent. I'm not all-knowing. Someday, coming up sooner than I like, they're going to be leaving the shelter of my wings and going to make their own way out in the world. I'm just going to be like, oh man, please God, protect them. Because I can't. I'm a father, I have compassion on my children, but I'm not an everlasting father. Jesus is the only one who can say, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you, even to the end of the age. No matter what comes your way, I'm right there. I got this. And then he's our prince of peace. Man, if we can have one thing during this holiday season, I think this comes to the top of the list. Jesus, give us peace. And Jesus says, I got that because I'm the prince of it. He gives us peace with God. That guilt and shame from our sin that we hang on to, Jesus died on the cross so that God says, oh, The price has been paid. I don't have to be really angry at you for this anymore because Jesus has already paid the price. We can be at peace with God. He's not our enemy anymore. He can give us peace with our circumstances because we trust him in the midst of it to know that if we're in this situation, he must have a good reason. And here's probably one of the most miraculous. He can actually give me peace with myself. You know who's my biggest critic? The most unforgiving person in my life is me. Because I know everything that I've done. I know what I was thinking when I did it, and I know there's no excuse for doing it. I have a really hard time deceiving myself into believing it's okay. The Prince of Peace comes in, and he's like, all right, Fred, I've forgiven you. It's time for you to forgive yourself. But at the same time, it's time to start, stop warring with yourself. Stop trying to live your life planted in two different worlds. Commit yourself fully to me. I'll give you that peace you want. I'll make it to where you're satisfied, complete, whole. Do you have Jesus today? What are you looking for? 
for 2022? And who are you looking to fix it? Some of us are looking at the next elections coming up in next November of, oh, surely something's going to happen to save us from what's happening now. Really? That's where you're putting your hope because all those people saved us so much the last time? Who are you hoping is going to come to the rescue? Put your eyes on the one who isn't coming. He's already come. He's already here. He's right there. Say, hey, do you want me? The rest of the world is going to poo-poo me as if I have no power and as if I'm weak and as if you're weak for trusting in me. Let me tell you, I am the wonderful counselor. I am the mighty God. I am the everlasting Father. I can give you peace. If you need that, just come to him and say, Jesus, I forsake all this. I forsake putting my trust in the Roman Empire. And I'm going to pin all of my hopes in you. I surrender it all to you. Take me. I know you got this. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for that child that was born. And thank you that you had him come from the land of Naphtali and Zebulun. God, I pray for this congregation, and I'll include my name in on it. First of all, God, I pray that they understand who Jesus really is and what he really has to offer. And if there's anybody living without him today, God, I pray that you change that. That you deliver them from their fear, their insecurity, their inability to control things on their own. I pray, God, that you give them a mind and a heart to just completely put their trust in you to where they can experience relief this morning. Comfort, new life, New hope, peace. For those of us that have already done that, we've already given our lives to you. God, I pray that you meet us in our times where we're acting like Zebulun and Naphtali and our greatest failures. God, help us to thrive in even the deeper grace that we experience during those times. You don't need a bunch of Christians that are just crushed with their guilt and wallowing around saying, woe is me, woe is me, I'm such a horrible person. You need a bunch of Christians that are living victoriously that have hope and joy that we can share with other people that need it. So I pray, God, that you give us the mindset to live there. We love you so much. Thank you for what you've done. In Jesus' name, because he's the one that you sent. We pray these things. Amen. You can stand to your feet. While Mike leads us in this one last song, what do you need to do this morning? Is there a decision you need to make? Maybe you need to say, hey, Jesus, take it. I'm yours. I totally want to belong to you. Maybe you're one of those Christians that you've already done that. You know you've already done that. You've enjoyed that, but at the same time, You're filled with anxiety and fear this morning because you started trying to take the wheel back or you're starting to look too much hope in other sources. And so you just need to come clean and say, all right, I lay it all down again. Jesus, take it. Maybe there's some other decision you need to make, something else that's weighing on your heart. I'm going to have some prayer partners up here that would love to pray with you. I'd love to talk with you in the back if you need it. What do you need this morning? Listen to the Prince of Peace, the wonderful counselor, and what he has to say as Mike leads us in this song. What a fellowship, what a joy to find, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on 
on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms, I have blessed peace. With my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms, leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms, will you stop leaning? Secure from all alarms, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Amen. Have a blessed week.